And thank you for joining us this evening at our Off the Stage series presented by Mubadara. My name is Rim Saleh, and I'm the Associate Director of External Relations and Partnerships for the Art Center. This evening's artist talk, Multiculturalism Going Deeper and Beyond, is presented in partnership with NYU Abu Dhabi Office of Inclusion and Equity. And it's part of Off the Stage, which also includes community dinners, visits to NYU Abu Dhabi classes post-show Q&As, career chats. Artists and residents are involved in various of the stage events, and the best way to hear about them is through our newsletter or by checking the Off the Stage tab on our website. I want to thank and welcome our panelists, Aleya Kassam, Kenyan feminist, storyteller, writer, and performer, Mubi Kaigwa, actor, writer, producer, and director of theater, film, and TV, Vamika Sina, NYU Abu Dhabi alumni, freelance journalist, writer, and photographer, and Wasim Chaudhry. He is a graduate from NYU Abu Dhabi class of 2020, where he majored in psychology and double minored in film and theater. This talk is moderated by Fatia Touré, Senior Director of Inclusion and Equity at NYU Abu Dhabi. We will have a Q&A session with the panel at the end of the conversation, so feel free to post your questions in the chat. Artist talks are recorded for social media and internal archiving purposes. I will now hand over to Fatia. Thank you so much um, for that warm welcome. I am not, oh, there I go. I was not seeing myself on the screen. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, as we noted, I'm Fatia Ture, and I'm the Senior Director for Inclusion and Equity here at NYU Abu Dhabi. And I'm so excited um, to be here with our esteemed panelists, Alia Kassam, Mumbi Kaigwa, Vamaka Singha, and Was Mohammed Wasim Chowdhury. Um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight as we begin the talk is that we hear these terms diversity, equity, inclusion, intersectionality, multiculturalism, right? And we know that they can be defined in a variety of ways. But as we think about the, uh, the genesis of this talk, multiculturalism going deeper and beyond, I wanted to start off by the ways in which we define that in this context, uh, in this context is that a situation in which different cultural or racial groups in a society have equal rights and opportunities and none is ignored or regarded as, as unimportant. And what we're going to do in the discussion today is focus on multiculturalism in the arts um, and the interplays of various identities from an East African lens. Um, we will have an opportunity to explore and analyze the nature of racial hierarchies in those contexts, diasporic identity and belonging, and understand how new kinds of representation have not only emerged um, and dissolved in the early 20th century and 21st century as we think about East African, East African um, countries, but also thinking about the cultural and the historical significance of the Black and Indian cultural um, and political formations in those contexts. And so we'll have an opportunity to hear from our esteemed panelists regarding their own personal journeys and their thoughts on these terms as we think about global diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, accessibility, and most importantly, um, access. 
And so just to start off with our, our panelists, I wanna start off um, with this question as we start our conversation. Um, how did you first experience multiculturalism or what was your first experiences um, with diversity and inclusion in your own unique context? And how were you introduced to these? What were your first, your earliest experience of these things growing up? And I am going to start off with Aaliyah, just because you look like you're ready um, to go. And um, then I will uh, follow up with um, Wasim. Thank you so much, Fatiha. It's so lovely to see you all again. Um, so I've been thinking about this and we're in a certain season right now. Um, we just had Diwali. Um, which is a Hindu festival with fireworks and lights. And I was thinking about how, when I was a little girl, we'd go on, um, I grew up in Nairobi, born and raised, and we'd go on like sort of town rides, my dad would call them, where we'd sit in the car and we'd go and look at all the Diwali lights. And then the Diwali lights would stay up, you know, all the buildings would be like lit up in the most beautiful way. And then they would stay up all the way through to Christmas. Um, and it just seemed like the sensible thing to do that then we would share lights, uh, Christmas would share lights with Diwali lights. And then around December the 13th, there would be the Jamhuri day where Kenya, you know, public holiday, we would celebrate um, the Republic day, so to speak. And I grew up in the nineties where we had the dictator Moy who would hold, I was gonna say how much has changed, but we would, they would hold huge celebrations at the, um, the stadiums and then you know different communities would be encouraged to come out and and they'd have sort of performative dances um and i remember thinking well what about like so where are our dances and then about last election cycle we got um the asian community were granted the status of the 44th tribe um and thinking about kind of tribe as the language of belonging i remember thinking so maybe we'll get to go and do bhangra down there at nyayo stadium um but one of my favorite things about nairobi specifically is how it really does feel like there's so many kind of religions and and um communities and growing up you just you saw it um in ways that i think i, I sort of took for granted at that time Kind of a long answer but yeah yeah thank you for that thank you for that um and and try being the language of belonging we're going to circle back ar around to that but i do want to hear um from you wasim what were your first experiences um growing up in your context um and how how were you first introduced to it um especially in, in terms of the ways in which you understood it I think that it's a really interesting question. And when you asked it, I was like trying to trace back when exactly I felt diversity inclusion. And I think probably as young as maybe four to five years, I think being biracial for me was something that wasn't common in my hometown. I'm from a really small town in Kenya called Eldoret. So we really, we just got our first KFC like last year or two years ago. So everyone's really excited. But I think growing up being biracial, it was quite evident that there was no one who looked like me and trying to fit into either being black or being like South, Southeast Asian and just having those paradox and how I, I'm like trying to figure out why is my hair so curly compared to my dad's? So like, hmm, why is my nose like bigger than my dad's and why am I lighter skin compared to my mom? And it was just like these things were reaffirmed quite a lot, even going to nursery school or primary school, you could tell that uh, the divide was always there from a young age. And for me, trying to figure out where I landed, which part I was accepted in. And it was for me, and as I think about it and reflect upon it right now, it's, it's a whole cultural shift. And people who looked like me were, I think, we had like one neighbor, but so it was very, very little biracial, uh, especially like South Asian and black. Uh, I think Kenya has a quite a huge number of biracial individuals who are white and black, but South Asian and black was like, you're like one of a rare breed. And if they see you, <laughs> you get confused sort of. 
being placed in a box where you're not really sure. So for me, I would say as, as early as nursery school. Okay, right. And as we're gonna come back to that to think about how those early memories really do live with us and shape us moving forward. Um, and just continuing on the Kenya uh, kind of training, growing up in Kenya and maybe some of the earliest um, experiences. Um, so um, Mumbi, do you want to talk a little bit and add a little bit um, about what were some of your earliest memories or um, intersections with either um, um, diversity or multiculturalism as you understand it? Mumbi? Can you hear me? Oh, you're on mute. mute. Yeah, oh, there so you I'm go. on mute, sorry. There you go, there I'm, you go. I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm at a hotel and um, it's Sunday. And so there's lots of, um, uh, lots of visitors and lots of music. So I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, I, um, I guess the first um, expression of um, multiculturalism that I can put my finger on was probably when I was in primary school. Um, I went to a school that um, was started by a couple who were um, South Asian and um, British and they wanted to give their children an opportunity to have a multicultural up, upbringing and a multicultural sort of space. So they didn't want to take their children to a fully international or European school, which was a possibility and, a, and, and possible for them. And they also didn't want to take their children to a Kenyan school. And so I went to school with people from Iraq and from Finland and from Poland and from Kenya and from all sorts of different places in Kenya. So I guess I, I grew up knowing that the world was a much, much larger space. Mm -hmm. But um, later on, I guess I, I, I began to appreciate that um, there was a Kenyanness that was important for me to ground, particularly when I had my own children who are British and Kenyan. And because they are from two cultures, it was, um, I, I don't want to say complicated, but it was, it was because we were in Kenya, I think Kenya is a space where we really accept that people can come from two different places. Mm -hmm. um, uh, more and more the political class have created a situation where that becomes a problem if you're from two different places within the country. But when you're from two different places from the, con from the world, so that when my, for example, my children are Kenyan and, and English, there doesn't seem to be that much of a tension, particularly because people, um, in my view, mm -hmm. tend to think that being what they call half caste, which my children hate the name, um, mm -hmm. are uh, that it's an advantage for them, whereas they feel extremely Kenyan. So navigating that whole space of them being feeling Kenyan, but looking as if they weren't Kenyan and being um, uh, treated as if they were not Kenyan and being asked, oh, is it, is it possible that you could actually be eating local food when you're actually white? Because of the hue of their skin, they, they are considered to be white as opposed to being Kenyan. So I, I think that that navigation was kind of um, problematic for, um, for us, um, but it, it, it always gives me extreme pride that they considered themselves to be Kenyan as opposed to feeling that they were English because they were born and raised here in Kenya. Mm -hmm. so that would be my, the first example that I, that I sort of like feel like I 
I hear when you say the word multiculturalism. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And Vamika, um, a little bit about your background, um, your experiences, and your first connection um, with hearing um, some of these terms. Yeah, so I, I grew up in Botswana, although I'm an Indian citizen. And I think similarly to what everyone's saying, you kind of get the idea of what multicultural multiculturalism is without knowing the word or the concept, kind of like through being and intuition, um, which I felt in primary school at the beginning and then more into high school. Um, both my schools were very international. Um, so there were a lot of people from Botswana, a lot of people from other African countries, but also large Indian population, um, some Europeans, defi definitely a lot of white South Africans. Um, so I was kind of exposed to a lot of different kinds of people. And as children, you know, you just make friendships, not really thinking about what that means. Um, but there were definitely like jokes. <laughs> there are definitely jokes about, you know, how you eat or how you dress or when you go to your friend's house and it's the food is super different or it smells kind of funny and you know you kind of take it in stride because you're kids and then you know when you start going to high school it starts to gain a bit more of an edge and you start gaining vocabulary to understand what it actually means to be around different people um, and then you sort of also understand that there are hurtful aspects to it where you know you may not have understood how to navigate, you know, letting other people be different and accepting that and not weaponizing it. Um, because I mean, the, the community in Botswana, I mean, there's definitely still a lot of racism. Um, there's definitely divisions in terms of like, are you an expatriate and what kind of expatriate are you? And what does that say about your class status or just like, what do we think about your food and the way you dress? Um, not to be all Debbie Downer about it. It was, there were a lot of amazing people who shared each other's cultures and celebrated that. But, you know, there's also a lot of, there's an edge to it that you start learning about as you go through your education system. And then when I went to university, then you start to articulate it for yourself. You start reading the texts and you start reading about decolonization and all of that stuff. And you're like, oh my God, what was my childhood? Um, so that was kind of my experience of trying to understand multiculturalism. And now it's, it's, it's a ubiquitous word. Um, it's like said all the time everywhere. And um, it's important to think to probe what it means in very specific contexts and through individual narratives, in my opinion, um, rather than just think about like, oh, it's uh, airy fairy, so nice, different cultures being together. Um, but what does it actually mean to be together? And with everyone bringing different baggage and different histories and experiences into that space, um, a lot of which come with, with trauma and then learning how to show compassion and care and solidarity with each other while being cognizant of you know the other person's experiences and past and background so I mean that's what I that's what I think no um and and that's that's great and I want to um I want to touch on um something that you said in terms of um making sure that we understand the individual context around this framing. And one of the things that we all um, are aware of is the way in which um, Africa, um, and it's, 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 you know, as a continent, um, can be described as being very monolithic without understanding all of the different complexities or maybe having an understanding of who lives there. Um, it primarily being viewed as a as a place where the majority of the populations are black um, or of African descent, and just thinking about um, Aaliyah, what you said about tribe um, being the language of belonging, um, particularly in Kenya, um, and I want to uh, think about a little bit and talk a little bit about um, how these experiences, particularly 
um, in Kenya or, and or Botswana or just thinking about East Africa in general um, may be similar or different uh, from other contexts globally or just even within the continent um, in terms of the ways in which and the interactions of difference and the different types of people who live um, together in community. So Vamika, if you wanted to continue on with that point, um, and then we could um, move over around backwards. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting question for me because um, when you're thinking about Africa being monolithic, um, I, I always like when I went back to India or when I went anywhere else, when I came to uni, I was like very defensive about, you know, being from Africa, but it was always like kind of complicated because I don't hold citizenship. Mm -hmm. And that's like an age old, um, it's still a dilemma that so many scholars try to unpack, like what does it actually mean to belong somewhere? But like, I kind of grapple with it through thinking that like belonging can be through memory and, your sense of place. Like when I think about the place that formed my identity, it's Botswana, it's in Africa, it's the codes that I picked up there and learned there. And that's, you know, so many people's experiences despite not having the paperwork. So, I mean, I, I don't have a resolute answer to that. I mean, but I think that just thinking about belonging in any sense has to, I think we have to push beyond the traditional modes of thinking of, like I retain citizenship from here or um, I have to know a set of rules, like why are there rules for belonging? Um, mm -hmm. You know, like I get, you know, I got, I get a lot of jokes like where people are like, oh, you're not actually from Botswana, but you're not actually from India because you didn't live there. Um, so like, where am I from then? <laughs> you know, so, but there's beauty, that's when, when I think about multiculturalism, there's there's beauty to me in my identity that do, those two things can have confluence, um, that there can be a confluence between the place that I don't have the passport to, but I grew up in, that I form my identity in, and the place whose culture I've inherited, who's literally reflected in my skin, in what my parents give me through their values, through what we celebrate. And those two can mix together because they do mix together in me. And so I try and like celebrate that um, in whatever space I go to and with people who are like me. Also because you don't often hear about narratives of South Asians in Africa, um, especially who are also non-citizens, um, but who do feel a sense of belonging there. And that's like true for so many third culture kids everywhere. And I do like that there's more being done about it in art. Um, and I think art is a place to do that. So, yeah. Thank you so much um, for that. Anyone um, wanna respond to that um, or we can move on to the um, next line of inquiry. Go for it, Leah. Um, I'm sort of thinking about, um, how we are known outside of the continent versus how we are known within the continent versus how we are known to each other within the country. And I think Kenya very specifically because, I mean, really we were under a sort of apartheid type situation and you see the divisions very strikingly in Nairobi. You know, we, we don't know each other. You know what I mean? Like, um, there's a way in which we've been, di you know, divided that has that has that has been like almost like calcified. The divisions have almost calcified, and so we've inherited these these ways of being without sometimes even knowing where they came from. Certainly in my generation, or why they are the way they are. And there's been very much, I think, the trauma response of very much kind of like move forward and don't look back. And so we don't realize the ways in which perhaps we did love each other in ways that are, are seem to be taboo now, whereas they were the norm perhaps several generations ago. Um, I think about, I think it's Mariam Kaba who talks about um, being in relationship with one another and therefore knowing each other's histories. And that's the thing I really yearn for in Kenya very specifically is how do we, how can we be 
in relationship with each other in ways that defy the sort of nation state or the political agenda, because a lot of this is, even the language of tribe is a very political agenda, you know? Um, and so it's difficult for me to think even at what the rest of the world thinks about us, because right now I'm really interested in what we think about each other. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Mumi, I see you've gone off mute. Did you want to add um, some additional context to this discourse? Mumbi? Um, no, 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 I didn't actually. Okay, okay, you're off mute. Sorry. All right, but we can actually move right. on. Um, um, on this section, and then we're going to actually move into the art. So I'm glad you you talked about that. But um, just thinking about that and thinking about some of the divides, right, and some of the experiences um, that you've had. Um, what are some of the unique ways in which you maybe experienced um, some of that that discrimination um, based on 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 your, um, based on your identity um, within that particular context. So I'm going to um, ask this question to Mohammed and to um, Mumbi. And, and discrimination can be, it doesn't necessarily, it can be in any of the ways in which you identify, whether that's across uh, race, ethnicity, gender, ability, status, age, um, whichever ways in which you want to add it into to this conversation. Um, I, I, shall I start? I, I... Sure, either you or Wasim can go first. I, I feel that um, as an older artist, I'm, I'm almost 60. I feel that one of the ways in which uh, I experience um, uh, some kind of tension is that often there is an, ex an, an expectation that I am going to be a particular way or I'm going to be a particular, um, that I'm not going to be able to do particular things because I'm um, older than most of the people who are in the arts. I'm right now in, um, um, in a film where, or movie series, a drama series where I'm playing the mother of the main character. And there's a certain deference to myself as Mobi, as opposed to the way that I feel inside myself. I feel um, as if I'm not really, I, I, I would, prefer that people or that uh, the, the crew in particular would treat me without so much deference and without calling me mom or without calling me, you know, it's sort of like, not because I don't feel my age, but because I feel that I'm an actor and I'm a tool and I'm able to be whatever it is that the, the script calls on me. Um, it would be wonderful to be um, given a role of um, a superhero. <laughs> Whereas, you know, most of the scripts that come about are, I'm the wife of an elderly person or I'm the mother of a younger person. And so I feel it in that way. I also think that um, because I don't, I originally I didn't speak very much Swahili because of the um, place in history where I was born. I was born very soon or just before independence. And um, as a result, the education that I received was very um, English, Scottish. And so I speak English almost as a first language. And so Kiswahili, which is what people speak now more commonly, and Sheng, which is the um, urban uh, street language that a lot more younger people speak, I don't, I don't speak it well. And so there's a certain um, cultural sort of divide in the fact that when I speak English, 
I will speak in clipped tones. Uh, I, I'll try even uh, to speak Swahili, but my accent will de defy me. And so there'll be people who will um, say, you know, when I was younger, uh, maybe up until my 30s, so I, Swahili was not the language that people spoke. If you wanted to get ahead, you spoke English. Whereas now there's been a complete shift where um, if you speak English, you're sort of like, where have you been? What, what's wrong with you? And Swahili is sort of like the more stronger language. So in terms of within the country, there's a division between those of us who are older who didn't learn Swahili. Even though I can speak it, I may not speak it in the manner in which it's spoken by the younger generation. Um, I will tend to speak more um, uh, formal Kiswahili as opposed to the younger generation who speak a mixture of various different languages within their Swahili speaking. And it's very noticeable that sometimes, you know, you're kind of left out. And so, you know, there's a, there's a cultural sort of shift and a cultural sort of divide between those of us who didn't learn uh, Swahili and those of us who came through the school system where Swahili was more acceptable. I can jump onto that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that is so interesting because when you ask the question, Fatia, I think for me, classism came up really quickly because it's like Kenya is so hierarchical in terms of who is making the most mm -hmm. money. But for me, uh, my, my, my visuals, my how I looked was contested upon these two cultures. But the thing that actually made me settle and sit in uh, sort of with the people was Swahili because I spoke Swahili quote unquote like the hood you know I grew up mm. in a really small town small school I never went to international school until I was in high school so the people I was interacting with uh, the word maybe local I uh, can come into it and like Mumbi was saying speaking Sheng and all that that made me actually get accepted to like uh, in, in the local communities like oh He's actually one of us, even though he doesn't look like us, he's one of us. And for me, that's it's a huge indication of, of where Kenya is. I think people in like different class system, I think upper class individuals don't really get to speak Swahili as well because maybe they're not interacting with uh, the locals as much. And and that, as Mubi said, creates a clear sort of border between the two people. And, and when you speak, it's like, nah, you're not one of us, you know, you're you're those people and if you can actually speak the language very well very raw very rigid it's you're included and so for me that was for me a ticket to a sense of belonging actually when i was younger great um thank you for that i actually want to shift the conversation a little bit and talk about your work in the arts um and i think um one of the terms that we hear used so much, um, and, and there, there's a good reason for it because it's something that all of us can connect to, right? Um, there, and there's a famous quote by Audre Lorde that says, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't live single issue lives. So as we think about intersectionality and the multiple parts of us that make us who we are, um, I would love uh, for you to talk about the ways in which you bring the various identities, all of the different identities in which you carry, and how you bring that into your space, into your art, into your work. Um, and so, uh, why don't we uh, why don't we um, continue continue with Moby in terms of that? What are the different ways in which you bring all of your different intersecting identities into your art, into your work? Moby? Yeah, well, um, about mm, just under, um, just over 10 years ago, I started to work in Kiswahili and particularly because I, I guess I was reacting to a feeling that we had been colonized, we had 
you, English was the language that we were using. And so um, I was sort of like pushing against the use of English in my work. And so I started to use Kiswahili. And what I did was I hired people from Tanzania and people from Kenya who spoke um, classical Swahili, what we call Swahili Sanifu, um, very deliberately in order to say, even though Swahili was a language that came to us, it's not a language that is felt as much as a colonial language as, a, as opposed to English. And so I started to create work that was in Swahili and to work also much like the Tanzanians with music and dance and narrative within one form. Um, so that my work now always has music, always has dance, always has musicians, traditional um, musicians. And that is sort of like a push against the wall of colonialism in order to tell our own stories, in order to tell our stories in a language that is accessible and, um, and available to more people. Um, and so as a result, I've got better at speaking Swahili because I'm working with people who, who speak it on a daily basis. And so that's the shift that my, that my work has taken. I, I tend to work in documentary theater. So it's always, I'm always working with real uh, stories, real events, real um, uh, nonfiction. And, and that also, I think, um, helps to push against the colonial space or the, mm -hmm. you know, helps to decolonize and to remember who we are and to be proud of who we are and to center ourselves and to create some sort of core values and to go back to um, a place that maybe we may have lost. Mm. Thank you for that. Vamaka? Um, I'm very much at the start of my career and budding in my practice. So don't know how much I can say, but um, I think navigating intersections of identity is something I do through writing for sure. Um, because I studied literature, um, I read the books that gave me Audre Lorde and that gave me, you know, those writers or scholars, those artists, those films that taught me how other people navigated it. And so for my thesis, I wrote a book and that was essentially what I was doing in that book um, through poetry, through essays, um, through just general prose. It's like trying to untie all the knots of yourself um, and you have to, I think the only way to do that is through art, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but you need, you need like, I was first a musician when I was younger, I'm a trained musician. So I think through a lot of things through the framework of music, um, I think of like the chorus that I need to hear the chorus first and hear what other people around me are making. And then I can kind of figure out my own tune and how I'm gonna build off of that. It's a lot like improv, it's a lot like jazz, which is also a big part of what I was researching in university. Um, and also the history of jazz as a musical form was about, you know, it was about the black arts movement in the US. It was, you know, a resistant form. So I was thinking about all of those things and how I could sort of resist being defined by external forces. Mm -hmm. So being defined by the nation state, the passport, the language, the skin color. Um, I wanted to define myself, but like, how do you do that? We don't get a blueprint to do that. It's always done for us. So I was like, I do not want to be a victim of other people's definitions. So to figure out how to self-define, I mean, it's everyone's goal. But the way I do that is through, you know, music and, and writing. And so my book was about that. It was, you know, looking at a lot of musical frameworks and also thinking politically about difference and about history that I'm trying to define myself, but I'm also trying to learn how to love other people and as they learn to define themselves. And it's not always pretty 
and it's not easy and we make a lot of mistakes as we do that so i mean definitely reading as well which is a classic lit major response but reading teaches you empathy and not only empathy for other people but for yourself mm. and because i think that especially for the context that we come from it's very easy to feel self alienation to feel alienated from things because how you might see yourself um doesn't align with how everybody defines you so that disconnect that tension it's that's trauma and it's so hard and we carry it in our bodies all the time and there are beautiful outlets to work through it like art but then a lot of people will find the wrong outlets or destructive outlets or they will just self destruct and that's kind of what i try to avoid in my life through through art i mean art is is everything and it's not financially viable but all the time for everyone um but if i didn't have that i wouldn't know how to navigate the intersections of who i am like all the confluences of the things that i am i would just become a victim to how the world has defined me so um i think it's resisting it's resisting mm -hmm external definition and getting some sense of agency art is agency in my opinion mm -hmm. if you are using it as an outlet to define yourself or to understand how to define yourself so yeah long answer i'm sorry <laughs> no no that was beautiful um that was uh, great i think we we took a lot from that in terms of are as a form of resistance, um, how we define ourselves and, and why um, it's important for us to have that grounding and that understanding. And as you talked about the ways in which you kind of unwound yourself, right? To find some of that um, for yourself. So thank you for that. Aaliyah, I'm coming to you next. I know you have a lot of thoughts on how you use this and how you um, put this into, into your work. Mm. So I think I've started seeing my work as a response to a poem by Michelle Mugo. Yeah. Um, and she asks, um, where are those songs my mother and yours always sang? fitting rhythms to the vast span of life. Um, and I think, you know, I, I struggle a little bit with the word identity because it feels, um, it feels rigid in a sense. Um, and, I, and I think maybe a word that I find more useful for myself when thinking about my work is, is maybe memories and history um, and kind of, like imagining with memory. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds kind of like floofy, but um, kind of thinking about like, how did we get here in this moment as we are, who we are in the ways that we are. Um, and I think similar to Vamika of kind of uh, to untying knots, mm -hmm. I, think, I think of kind of like maybe masala tea, you know, and like, by the time it's finished brewing, you know, you, you smell and then you start sniffing like the different aromas, you sniff the cinnamon, you sniff the cardamom, you sniff, you know, and thinking about like, um, how the, the house of, of the work is as important as the what of the work. Mm -hmm. And so even when thinking about um, intersectionality, when thinking about the ways in which things intersect, um, how does that inform who you work with um, the types of, of, of forms that you work in. Um, and uh, sorry, now I'm just thinking about masala tea. The thunder clouds are in the distance. I see Mo it's raining with where Mubi is and my brain has just gone directly to masala tea. <laughs> um, and, and I'm kind of left thinking like, if it isn't identity, what, what might be a, another way of considering the ways of being? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, Wasim, I'm going to have you answer the question um, in terms of um, the ways in which you, you bring this into your work and the current work you do. And then we did have some 
questions um, from the um, audience members that I would I would love to ask you all. Wasim. Thanks, Matia. Uh, it's it's really interesting because as uh, Mumbi, Vameka, and Aliyah were going around, and I was like, hmm. and I really reflected upon the work I'm doing, and thinking about it is quite interesting because it is an art, and the work I do is basically in the field of like diversity and inclusion, and a, a big portion of it is sort of uh, facilitating dialogue on on sensitive and difficult conversations, and I. That by itself is an art because I think for me, rediscovering my identity or sort of channeling that even more has been very evident, especially for example, when you're trying to do a role play on a different character, like I'm role playing with, I work with my colleagues and at work colleagues, it's really interesting when we channel different characters in terms of their identity, like a man, a woman, white race, different religion and really thinking how that comes into play in the in the specific conversation that we are having and for me it's 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 been a lot of introspection and trying to pull certain things about my identity that it comes to the work for example i think coming to enoya Abu Dhabi, i was really conflicted about my identity and being in dialogue and in conversations with my peers and all that i was able to rediscover my black identity because I felt it was very silenced, very sort of hidden in the background. Uh, but but through dialogue, which I'm describing it as an art right now, I think being able to be more comfortable sort of speaking about that identity sort of conflict I had. And and now it's a part of sort of who I describe myself as when, when my sister speaks to me from Kenya and she's like, oh, so do you still identify as black? <laughs> I was like, yeah. And it's really funny because she doesn't identify as black anymore. I mean, she, she's never identified as black. She's identified as biracial, mixed race. And I think the work I do is it's constantly sort of redefining um, how I view myself. And I think it's really exciting. Great. Thank you for that. Um, we actually had um, a couple questions that came in um, for the in the chat and one question, um, any of the Kenyans um, can, um, can answer this. And then um, for Botswana, if you are aware, I would have you answer it as well. Um, they wanna know what percentage of the Kenyan population is of Indian um, descent um, versus what are the what's the population breakdown if any of you um, know that. And um, again, there's also some um, a question that grounds why was the Indian population introduced in Kenya? And we can actually start to have a brief conversation around colonialism and how different populations got play, introduced in different um, places. But if we could answer that for Kenya and then um, the demographic makeup of Botswana as well, if either of you know. Um, I can I can start. Um, mm -hmm. So the I mean I, I hesitate to use the word Indian because for many um, mm -hmm. Kenyans of South Asian descent would have moved here before there was the division of India Pakistan, which is why we sort of refer to the term South Asian. Mm -hmm. um, it's less right now. I think it's less than one percent in Kenya. But um, in Nairobi, you would see, you would see, you know, it's, it's a higher percentage in, in Nairobi. Um, so it's, it's, it's small, um, but it's had a, um, from a business point of view, it's had quite a significant, the community's had quite a significant, um, I mean, contribution, presence, you know, and so in a way, sometimes, um, the visibility, the, the, the minority seems more visible um, mm -hmm. just because of the spaces they, that, that we occupy sometimes. Um, I think the word introduced is very interesting. Actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you hear often the, the, the thing of, you know, Kenyans, were, uh, in, South Asians were brought down as indentured laborers by the British to build the railway, you know, in the late 1800s. You'll hear that a lot. And that's true. And also, you know, people from the South Asian region, um, a lot of the Asian region have been 
crossing the Swahili seas way before the British, you know, learned about cinnamon or cardamom, <laughs> way before they ever arrived, you know, there's been um, relationships across the Indian Ocean, across what I call the Swahili seas. Um, you know, I, I, I hear it told that it's, there was a Gujarati, so a, someone from, originally from Gujarat who showed Vasco, who actually like took Vasco da Gama around when Vasco da Gama arrived. Um, I have thoughts about that. So um, the history is, is way longer than, mm -hmm. than let you think. And the relations are not just defined by British colonialism. And I think kind of one of the things that's interesting is trying to find, find those roots again. Mm. Thank you. Vamako? Um, statistically, I have no idea. I would say there are a couple of thousand Indians. Um, mostly we arrived, I don't think it had anything to do with colonialism. I think it had everything to do with economics, although the two are connected, but mainly because um, Botswana discovered diamonds. We're the world's largest diamond producers. So it became pretty attractive to do trading and business there. And most Indians actually are working in business and finance right now in Botswana, which um, creates a lot of ideas about us and our class. But um, yeah, I would, I would say that's what it is, but I would have to be fact-checked. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and um, as I see we're running out of time and we didn't get to talk about class and the role that it plays. Um, there is a question that came into the chat and I think it's important because when we had our pre-prep pre session, we did talk about this a lot um, in terms of uh, the difference between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation, right? And how do we navigate that in a context in a country um, where you have so many people from so many different identities and what is the line between appropriation and appreciation? And I know, uh, I think it was Moni who had a, a story around this and, and Aaliyah who had, who had stories around this. And so I would love if, if either one of you could share and, um, and anyone else can chime in as well. You're on mute. <laughs> oh God, this Zoom stuff is not my thing. <laughs> here I am. Here you <laughs> are. And so I have to, I'm, I'm back. Yeah, okay. So okay. I was going to say that Alea um, made a mention about um, something that caught her attention. And so I'll tell the story. I traveled. <clears throat> in 2007 to a, a feminist festival to show my work as the first representative at that festival from the whole continent of Africa. And often we are required to represent the whole of Africa in a way that um, makes it uh, quite awkward because of, of course we can't represent Botswana and we can't represent mm -hmm. Senegal and we can't represent Cape Verde. But in order to feel as if I was um, doing my part in being from Africa, the continent, I um, thought that I would create a um, traditional costume because we don't have a national traditional costume. I chose to wear a sari with Maasai beadwork. Um, so I had Maasai necklace and Maasai earrings and or Maasai beaded necklace and, and earrings. And um, even as I think of this, the Maasai beads were, are not indigenous. They came from Czechoslovakia, but, you know, that's another story. <laughs> but um, in order to speak of the indigenous people of Nairobi where I live and where I was born and where I grew up, 
I chose the Maasai beadwork because they were the original um, uh, can, um, inhabitants of Nairobi. And the name Nairobi is a place of cold waters, which is a Maasai word. Um, and then I chose the um, South Asians who came to build the railway, who, because of their um, their work in bringing the railway from the coast to Uganda created the trading post that was then to become Nairobi, which is the capital of Kenya. And so I've, I've been having some really interesting com conversations with friends of mine who um, speak about cultural appropriation and say that there's no such thing. Mm. I Mm. Only now realize that I'm culturally appropriating the sari and the and the Maasai culture, and very often when people speak of Kenya, they speak of the Maasai and they speak of the Maasai Mara and they speak of things that are you know to do with wildlife. But there was a conversation that we were having about whether um, I I feel. Um, right now maybe not tomorrow or the next day that when um white people wear our clothes that's not right but then this person was saying but then how do you feel about the fact that you wear jeans or you wear t-shirts with the name coca-cola on them mm. and so there's, there's yeah, a debate that's going that. on between us about yeah, mm. that's, that's another panel for another day we don't have time for that right now. Um, but yes, there there is a line between uh, cultural appropriation and, and cultural appreciation. But um, as I see that we are just really, really coming up on time and there were just so many topics that we didn't get to talk about that we talked about the last time. Um, I do, um, I don't want everyone to kind of leave this meeting and thinking about in terms of the framing of the conversation um, and to think about, you know, just, we just kind of focus around some of the issues, but what are some of the opportunities or one lasting thing that you want to leave with the audience um, as we, we close out? So uh, why don't I go to you, uh, Vamika, first? And then um, I'll go to Wasim and Mombi, and then Alia. Oh wow, it's intimidating to start. Um, so the pressure's on. <laughs> what to leave the audience? Um, just to um, engage with art, to read about as many different kinds of people as possible. Mm. I think that's it's the best education and it's fun and art is fun um yeah because it, it makes life worth living and it helps you understand other people and it mm -hmm. helps you understand yourself better and that's just always good it's all good great thank you for that Wasim. uh i think for me uh, it would be, I think the, the journey of, of sort of rediscovering yourself is a lot to do with the inside. And so a lot of inner work is, is so essential. And I think I'm still on that journey. And I think many of us are still on that journey of sort of looking inside and seeing what are the things that come up. So for me, that's, uh, I guess that's the last few words I can say. It's just, I guess, encouraging us to all look inwards and hopefully become more multicultural in a, in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Mommy? Um, I would say that the thing that I'd like to leave people with is um, the question as to whether time is linear or whether it's cyclical. Mm. Um, I think the Western model says that there is time that ends, whereas on our continent, things go round and so there are seasons and there's always time to regroup and to rethink and to redo and I kind of like that expression of time as opposed to the linear expression of time. Okay, thank you. And Leah, last word. Um, oh, 
Can you hear me? It says my internet yeah. is unstable. Okay. Um, I think, I mean, Wasim talked about looking inwards, which I really love. And I would say um, kind of to then add to that, which is to say to look outwards and consume voraciously, like mm. in unexpected and surprising places and in forms and genres and mediums that perhaps are surprising to you. Um, to really like follow your curiosity and kind of be be brazen about the sorts of spaces that you look for uh, look for art. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much um, for all of your the wisdom that we shared on this panel. Um, the start of the conversation. Um, again, uh, we will share with you all their bios, amazing work that each and every single one of them is doing. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Reem um, to close this out. Thank you so much, Fatia, and thank you to our panelists. I'd like to also thank you for staying with us and um, we hope to see you again in our up upcoming off the stage events. On November 22nd, we have Arts Chats, Building a Life as an Artist in the UAE part two. And on the 23rd of November, we have a creator's workshop, Satwa Stories, Poetic Exploration through Documentary Techniques. You can register for both of these events on our website. Stay safe and see you soon.